and welcome to Eat Your Backyard, my YouTube channel, where I talk about all kinds of edible things, also tropical and subtropical things. If you're into that kind of thing, I hope you will subscribe. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, the easiest, simplest, bestest way is to, anytime you go to Amazon to get whatever, just use one of the links in any of the videos on the Eat Your Backyard channel. We have links there to seeds and other things you might be interested in, like plants and, well, sugar cane, banana, mango stuff, all that. You can click on those and go to Amazon, and then you can get to wherever you were getting. Perhaps you were buying some sweet new mop head replacements. Or some pigeon peas, even better. Or maybe some moringa seeds. That's a good buy on Amazon. That's how I produced this, by the way, which is my moringa seed tree. <laughs> yeah, we might have to do that. We're about to get some mega swell. I haven't checked it this evening, but it's about to get big and windy surf. I'm looking for different varieties of sugar cane right now. I've got three. And I'd like to have six or seven varieties. I have yellow, green, and red. And I would like to have purple, black, the striped, and any other variety that I can find to include interesting like node deals and so on. Now this area I've been tending and developing for the last couple of years, let's say. And it's really come along with the uh, incorporation of a lot of the permaculture stuff I've been doing. It's just going off. And I scored over the weekend. And here's my secret. If you shop around at places like Walmart, and I'm saying specifically Walmart, you can find killer deals on plants sometimes if you know what to look for. So, and they're hiding in plain sight, so to speak, but often they'll have a lot of citrus and you know, I've, like you could see that's a citrus here on the right of the screen. See how that does in my backyard. So I'm never that enthused <clears throat> about citrus. It's so buggy here where I'm at. But there are a lot of gems I do know grow well here, and look what I found. I got these babies for $8 a piece. Dwarf Cavendish bananas. Very, very common dwarf banana. Beautiful. And uh, I bought three. There's another one. And then I put one back in there, but this will fill in nicely. I've already got some dwarf Cavendish. These two bananas you see in the foreground there, background, so to speak, is the result of planting Cavendish uh, banana pups from an original that I had bought, I think, at Walmart as well. Maybe Lowe's. But they're heavy fruit producers, and you don't have to wonder about that. This is one that was the first fruit from a transplant, which is usually not that strong, and you can see it produced not bad bananas. Not a lot of hands there because, like I said, it was from a cutting. But, uh, you know, that's why we have the Dwarf Cavendish rocking it in the fall blue skies of Florida. I'm really trying to regain the banana grove effect that I had so achieved in the northern end of my yard. Of course, I sacrificed all of that for the chicken coop capability, which I've never regretted. So yeah, pretty satisfied with this and also very satisfied. I keep coming back and <clears throat> showing updates on this, on the uh, roselle, which is an edible form of hibiscus. You can see it's also a great source of pectin. You can eat the leaves, you can eat the flowers, you can eat everything, it tastes like cranberry. You can use the stalks to make cordage, very fibrous. Another great one, grew that from a seed, and I would grow many more. In fact, I had planted two more back here, but the chickens devoured them both. That's the, uh, the issue of the day. 
is ensuring those little chickies can no longer escape from the backyard chicken pasture, so to speak. Now look at this dadal hot pepper plant. Buddy of mine gave me this plant. Little hot peppers are actually kind of doing it. I keep moving it around so it won't get any sprinkler water on it. <clears throat> Here, of course, the sprinkler water is very salty. Oh, I'll give you a couple more updates. Now, I've been using these fiberglass stakes with great success. This is a very small tree, but it's a lime tree, kefir lime tree. And uh, you can see how the leaves are upside down. That's because I tied it up to this fiberglass pole. It's a Miracle Grove pole I got at Lowe's and just kind of hammered into the ground with a rubber mallet or whatever. And I'd, I had one we'd used to bang together a bed frame that we ordered and um, pound it in the ground and then tape up this kefir lime, which was kind of bending over and going in places I don't want it. This pole is thick enough that I don't really have to worry about it falling over. I can count on it being there for a good long time while this thing gets big because I want to keep it there for at least probably a couple years. So I also did the same thing to this tamarind tree. You can see what I did there. I tied it up to the uh, same kind of pole, but it was leaning way over. And this one will look great on its own too. It's growing up beneath the canopy of this mango, but it gets full southern exposure, so it'll, it'll do great here. But uh, I want it to be in more of an upright tree rather than, than a low weeping bush style tree that takes forever to get high enough to provide a cool yield of fruit. So stoked on those two new inclusions. I feel like, you know, they grew, they both grew after planting, but in the wrong direction, but this was the next step. Now I've been using to tie them up this, I've got to trim off the ends, but this grafting tape, and that, that seems to be the best way to tie these things up because it doesn't really doesn't cut into the branch and once you trim off the excess it you can hardly see it so yeah let's go over ahead and let's go over and get that this is just out of what we've been eating now all of our keep in mind all of the food scraps which my family and I produce go back into this yard 100% of all food scraps go back into the yard either eaten by the chickens or in the compost and then I have things like this, which go back into the yard in even more interesting ways, which is two avocado seeds. Now, I took the skin off and I soaked them in water just to get them hydrated. And you can see, they look like they have been. And I just actually, I have a pineapple dehydrating inside right now in the, my dehydrator. And uh, I'm gonna plant this in the vertical Grower. So let's look at where we want to plant this first. I've been transforming my vertical grower into a pineapple growing machine. I'll give you an update on that. I learned lessons as I go, as I did this. And uh, really cool. This one like hardly had a top on it at all. And then, you know, after planting it and watering it, it just perked right up with even more thick growth. So I was surprised by that. These other two pineapples were just ones that I had kind of halfway dying in a dry corner for a long time. And I just thought I'd see if they would come back. I think this was, this was one I got off of a, of a grocery store pineapple. It's kind of yellowish though. Don't like the, don't like that look, the yellow look. Didn't seem like a healthy pineapple would look like that. And they, you can see these other pineapples that I planted around the corner are all doing pretty well. And how I know they're doing well is after leaving them for a while, I could feel them in there. They've grown some roots. Like this one, I can tell just now getting, this one I was not having good feelings about. See the inside, how it's all dead like that? Well, it looks like, I'm gonna say because I can feel it has roots now, it's gonna do well. This one, okay. 
It's alive too. Who would have thought? Wow, I'm stoked. Oh, this one, I don't know. It doesn't really have roots and it's the weakest of the bunch, but now the decision of where to plant them, I have decreasing options. I don't want to plant them where things are doing well, like I have this this radish, not radish, uh, beet, I believe those are. Same here. Planted a bunch of little beets. I think they're beets or radishes, but anyway, they're weird looking, so I'm going to keep them. And then I have mints and peppermints and so on growing around the bottom, which never really did that well. And this one especially, like it's just never going to do well. I, I don't know. I'm going to smell that. See that mint? Usually easy to grow in most locations. Here with the salt water on the leaves, not so much. Mmm, smells so good though. Man, I wish I could grow it easily, but look what happens to it. It just gets fried. It's like cooked to death. Put that up there. So I'm going to just grab out all of that. Ooh, that I bet you that's a minty goodness right there. Oh, look at this. All the way through. <laughs> All right, let's throw this back in here. Mint, that was the mintiest, ooh, man, that smells good. The mintiest compost. I'll get my little shovel. You gotta check out this shovel. If you garden a lot, you can appreciate stuff like this. Look at that. I think it speaks for itself. Large, gel-handled, decent scoop shovel. It's like the shovel you always wanted at the beach when you were a kid. All right, let's see. So I definitely try not to complicate this. Hey, Camel, good to see you. Yeah. I don't even care that the mint's in there. I know it would die off anyway. life easy. Oh, this one's growing from the other side. Oh, there you can see the root ball. Sorry. Take this out. Chuck it up into the forest there. David the Good? No way. Hello and welcome, sir. Yes, I do. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I just, you know, I feed it the bunny turds and I feed it the worm tea. <laughs> and uh, it does what it does. All right, let's see. So we're planting some avocado seeds. I was just watching a video on your channel. Love your channel, by the way. Big inspiration. All right, look at this. Nice. Now, two types of pineapples that I know about, well, I know there are more, but the two types that I typically have access to are the kind you get in the grocery store, which tend to have this smooth edge. You can run your fingers along. It's not serrated. Pack it in a little bit. I'll come back and water that, but should be good. I find that the pineapples don't really need that much extra soil. Which is nice. Now I did recently give them the. Yeah, they don't. I agreed. Yeah, David the Good. They don't really seem to need much soil. Yeah, which is why. <laughs> yeah, I know. I hope. I hope. Yeah, which is why I love the vertical pot system. I wish I had a less expensive way to do this same thing. These things are actually pretty expensive, and I was thinking of a kind of a few different ways to do this, and I'm sure there's many ways to do vertical gardening where the water, you know, kind of flows down through and is elevated up from, you know, maybe not as much pest exposure or whatever. Uh, in my case, it helps for a lot of reasons because just that way I have the Atlantic Ocean, which is always blowing in. You know, basically what I'm in is a very sandy environment. I mean, if you look at that, Oh, that's cool. 55 gallon plastic drum garden. I need to look into that. 
Well, yeah, so if you look at this, that's, that's the sandy soil that I've uh, got back here. And then I'm constantly enriching it. Uh, unfortunately, I still do have to bring in a bag or two of the potting soil from the, the chain store, but uh, I am actively building my compost capability over here and super stoked on that. Now that my egg production is up, I'm even getting the eggshells back into the compost. Bottomless pits of composting. Everybody with an earshot of this video should integrate composting into their life. It's one of the most easy, fun things I think you can do in gardening. And, uh, sorry, I'm <laughs> got distracted. I just got the old spider in the face syndrome. We have all these crab spiders back here, so I'm constantly walking into them. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, layers of the, the carbon chicken bedding, the, the wood chipped chicken bedding infused with the ch with the chicken manure all, all the eggshells go back in there leaves sticks banana leaves sugarcane leaves bamboo leaves layer after layer after layer and it just continues to compress down and if you look at how much soil you can produce in two bins just of that size and then so simple to deal with really which is you know going to make you want to do it which is where you just when you're done getting it kind of filled up the process is you just slide off you know get another person to help you just slide off these rings that you made out of just a, a circle of animal wire place it in a new location and then pitchfork from one location from the top to the bottom you know the, what's on the top goes to the bottom and so on and you just fill it in that way to the new location and that's how you turn it over and i would say if you do that you know maybe do that at six months and then uh you know, give it another six months, I think you're gonna have some pretty killer compost. And uh, it amazes me how much the leaf matter can compress. It's fun watching it. We, we all call it the bottomless pit. It eats everything. <laughs> and by the way, the easiest way to compost is don't even get an animal ring, just get a shovel, you know, or a sharp stick and just dig a hole and throw your food scraps in in the hole and the earth will eat it you know the worms are going to come up and eat it things are going to come up and eat it as long as there's water down there so i would always recommend that um you know i've never got caught a fish i didn't want to plant around a tree in my yard because knowing the effect it's going to have for sure all right let's take a look at these sweet little hens now here's an amazing thing Yeah, I know. I love the vigor of the mango. Oh, by the way, David the Good, check this out. So this is the eastern side of my house and uh, I have three mango trees. This is a Tommy Atkins, which I'm sure you're well aware of as a incredible staple variety. And, uh, you know, my theory is every year after planting I mean, every year after harvesting the last mango, go in and trim down, try to thin out the wood, try to take out the wood out of the tree to keep it low. Because here, and here's how I learned this lesson, <laughs> which is through this beautiful Hayden mango tree, which produces, I think, quite possibly the most delicious mangoes I've ever tasted. It got gigantua. I let it get away from me. And now it is just a beast of a mango tree. All right, let's see. Let's see how those little hens are doing. Well, they're eating a little bit of leftover food. My wife can't help but spoil the hens a little bit. These chicks have been doing so well. Although I will admit, they can be a little bit loud. Which be <laughs> but they've proven to be excellent, you know, little pets, as well as egg layers. Now that's a good plan, Camel. Yeah, let them grow outside until they're about seven foot tall. 
Yep, that's a winning plan. You know, I did that with a strawberry tree I've got growing over on the other side of the yard, and wow. Oh, that makes me think about a video I was watching on the uh, on David the Good about the growing growing fruit from seeds, growing fruit trees true to seed. The idea that you know grafting onto things that grow well as seeds if they don't produce fruit. I thought that was fascinating. And then the idea that if you do grow it from seed, you could actually name it your own variety, especially you know the ones that have variability in the seed. I thought that was really cool. I think, and that made me look at the strawberry trees in my yard in a whole different way. Hey, Treasure Outdoors. Yeah, absolutely. Discover something new. Yeah, so this is the free range chicken area. Plenty of roosting. All the organic matter I can produce in my yard going right back in there. You can see that's a lot of sea grape leaves mixed with palm, mixed with dracaena leaves, mixed with everything else that I chop and drop back here. These hens, we let them have after the morning, we open it up and let them have access to this whole area so they can go in and lay eggs. Today was a five egg day. Five hens, five eggs. Which to me... <laughs> is incredible every seed has a unique genetic heritage that's right vicky absolutely well said yeah seeds speaking of seeds bananas what an interesting idea of bananas and banana seeds and the seed being bred out of bananas in order to be able to eat it more easily Oh, interesting. I'm not sure I haven't grown the Cape gooseberries. I, I'm actually not too familiar with those. This is another one of those musa left over from the banana patch I moved. They keep growing from little pieces of musa that got chopped up and distributed around. I'm really, it makes me really miss my, my musa banana grove, which was producing always. I had one hand of ripe, one, uh, you know, tree full of ripe fruit and another one that, that was uh, getting ready to start getting ripe and well good trade right good trade hey you you pecking at me yeah they definitely jumped to eat the banana leaves too and you know the interesting thing i've been one of the things i want to do here is of course restore the nitrogen in the soil as much as i can um we've got pigeon peas here and also mulberry trees for shade and for the berries of course you know multi-function function stacking so i plant these tall cuttings of mulberry and they're almost out of the range of those chickens but if you ask me that looks like a beak shaped bite so you know they're getting they're clearing a good four feet and i think it's always do you want to cage the chickens out or cage them in because they really do have, uh, they found a way to get out of my little system, that's for sure. And I know exactly where, the, where they uh, escape from. Do you like the chicken tender I made for Jack? This is the uh, chicken tender. If you just move this towards any chicken, just move it towards them slowly, they'll automatically go the other way. And when you've got a chicken escape, and by the way, when we decided to expand and give them full range to everything, uh, I'm, I uh, kept this, this gate out in front because one of the cool things is I'll back up. You can see from like from the deck of my backyard looking towards the ocean. Uh, you know, you can see the, the chickens that always want to are always going to run to the front of the cage every time our door back door opens or anybody walks around the side they just are like guard chickens oh thanks david appreciate it yeah that would be cool to breed them so that uh they're less yeah less seeds but enough like maybe just like an apple like four or five seeds in a banana so you could grow them from seed yeah that would be more viable maybe in the long run certainly if you're 
run for food. Yeah, this system has been working out great. I built this coop, as you can tell the custom upside down waves because I surf built into the coop, but it's worked out really well. I, I, bit it, I built it for both function and also for a little bit of architecture kind of fun and also ventilation, but yeah, highly functional setup. And my most recent addition was once they started to lay eggs was I immediately installed this, uh, this supplement feeder, which is just uh, simply oyster shells. And on the other side, grit. So those two things seem to be pretty fundamental to chicken health, so I give them those all the time. Now I just use the, you know, sewer pipe, whatever, Oh, drinking water pipe and then the bend with a cap. I use two of those circular drill bits to drill down and, and put two little holes in each one of the horizontal pipes and so it just gravity feeds them. And now on the bottom of those pipes though I drilled a lot of little tiny holes. And the reason I did was because it probably will get a little bit of rain on it here, but they're both just basically rocks. So as long as they drain, I think they're going to be okay. I didn't want to sweat it. I don't really have room inside the coop. We'll take a look inside the coop, actually. I've been trying to really keep the coop super clean now, of course, because we're eating the eggs. And it's pretty easy to do it, actually. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's so cool about the hybrid cross with the bananas. That's fascinating. Well, I think I'm going to move that Musa because they just get too darn big. I, I've spent too many, I've had too many moments by this area that have just, my life has passed before my eyes. Like I realized I shouldn't have been near it. So I'm just trying to keep everything away from the power lines because as soon as it starts to blow, it's a, it's a nightmare. But unfortunately, let the mango tree just get level five gigantua. Uh, right now, it's trimmed away from the line, which is nice. But, you know, just if I let it go for just a little while, it's going to be over that thing again. So really important to have power <laughs> if possible. I mean, I could do that right now. I don't want to do without power. Oh, look at this other cool little find I found at Walmart, believe it or not. And that's a Monstera Deliciosa. Delicioso. And uh, yeah, Camel. David, I'm sure you know this one. James Tropicals. You know, the famous, you know, if you surf, you've got to have it. It's like on every iconic longboard ever made. This and a hibiscus flower. Yeah. <laughs> and then behind it, of course, I planted this yellow dragon fruit. Um, love this because of its ability to grow up. It'll attach directly to this, to this fence. And maybe I'll go around front. I just planted a, a little sugarcane patch uh, with some green and some red sugarcane back there. And it's already sprouting up. Maybe we'll go take a look at that before it gets dark. But um, I think I'm going to let one of the bunnies out to do an exercise, we let one out earlier. I'd like to get him out. Who's the lucky bunny? You're the lucky bunny. All right, hold on one minute. I'm gonna grab that little bunny and let him free. Out you go, Thumps. There he goes. Now that's a happy bunny. I'm gonna go right to town eating this lemongrass. I'm just gonna let him be. Happy to see this pigeon pea starting to get up above the level here. I really want a shady environment. That this this is not tenable the way I have this situation engineered here with this tarp doesn't work anymore it leaks but the point is it's not a good setup at all i'm going to remove this tarp completely and i'm going to extend the roof of this hutch i'm also going to seal this wood 
but I'm gonna extend this over to the side so that we have full shade over this area because without it, it just becomes like an oven. It's too hot. That's why we have the tarp over. The tarp at least keeps it from getting too, too, too hot. You know, we, we keep a pretty close eye on the temperature. <laughs> Feel bad for the rabbits if it gets too hot. Bring them out ice cubes. But uh, really stoked on the addition of Moringa. Really committed to the Moringa deal this year. Got it growing everywhere. Got it growing in, you know, maybe weird places in a way. Uh, just, you know, somewhat near power lines, but I'm really committed to trimming them so I don't feel uh, any reluctance to plant them somewhat near the power line. But you can see they're growing pretty well. The fig tree does not look very happy. <laughs> yeah, the fig tree back in the, uh, back in the bunny run is, uh, it's, it's actually doing okay. Uh, usually, and as a matter of fact, usually this time of year, most of the leaves will be absolutely off of it. it this year was the, one of the first years it had a, a second fruit. And uh, this year we actually, you can see we got, there are fruit on it and we'll probably feed most of them to the chickens, but, um, but yeah, it's, not that strong. In fact, we have a fig tree back here that I guess I've somewhat given up on because the chickens are just have just chowed it down. There's a little Olympus fig there. Realizing now that if I'm going to have that, I'm going to have to um, for sure cage those chickens out. All right, so let's take a quick look. We've got the soursops both kind of coming back. Really stoked on this patio mango. This is that uh, Malika banana. Sorry, Malika mango. Got bananas on the mind. Yep. Oh, and I didn't plant the, I didn't plant the avocado. I was looking for that shovel. I guess I could just plant it with a, I could just plant it with the hand shovel. I was boasting about the hand shovel, but man, $10. And what I do is I plant it here because I know the, so the soil is super loose. You can see it's got some organic content to it. I don't sweat the weeds at all now. Every weed I see is food for the rabbits or the bunnies. And uh, since it's now all being fed, you know, organically, naturally, not a problem. So even though they will send it a taproot, I think I'm fine just to plant it there. Put it in a big pot when I dig it up. I'm almost tempted to plant two. That looks like a winner. It's already got a root. I bet you that's going to grow. You know, I, I always say the key to growing a pit is water it. <laughs> you know, people grow these on their counter or whatever. But I say that because the key to having this back bed area is for me to water it. There is no way around it. It's, it's an arid spot, and I actually don't want this rather salty irrigation in my yard hitting it. So you can see, I just buried it like, you know, practically a half inch under an inch of the ground. But since the soil's so loose here, that'll come up later. In fact, I just planted a, I just dug up a longan that fell from this tree right here. And uh, put it in a pot, I can show you that, but I get a number of fruit trees growing on the old grow table this time of year. I'm going to harvest this long branch here very soon to, uh, to get the leaves. And uh, I do plan on doing a burn here pretty soon with my branches that I've stored up. In fact, I was even considering building somewhat of a drying, a curing table for the branches I harvest just to, to kind of dry them out more to make it easier to burn. But that's my plan is to get the biochar back in to get the, the uh, you know, close that loop. Get those micronutrients flowing in in a way that I don't have to go buy them and import them. Really looking forward to that. I am going to get another mango and really the question is now, because mangoes are really my, my best trading asset. Although the eggs, you know, here's, here's the funny thing. The eggs I've been producing, now I make supernatural claims about these egg, eggs practically because I'm feeding them these black fly soldier larvae and tons of fresh veg, uh, veg material from the yard all the time and organic feed. So they're getting a really good diet. And when I started eating them in the, in the morning, 
uh, I felt an incredible rush of energy and positive affect, a mental, positive mental state change. And it was drastic feeling of contentedness, energy, really good. So I was like, okay, whoa, that's weird. Uh, it also lined up with something that uh, I was had heard on the Andrew Huberman podcast, the Huberman Lab podcast, which is, in my opinion, the best podcast ever created. He's a neuroscientist. Well, he said there's a lot of studies on eating protein in the morning and its, and its clear correlation with muscle function and energy and so on and so forth. Okay. And I claim that since these eggs are past your raised, meaning they're raised out, they can eat bugs and stuff, and uh, they eat natural plants, and they also are organic, because we don't know antibiotics, and et cetera, that, you know, they're, and we're feeding them lots of supplements to make them high, high uh, nutrient content like this larva, which by the way, that type of larva is supposed to be very elevated levels of calcium and other uh, minerals and vitamins and so on and so forth. Okay, that these are super powerful eggs. Now, I'm going to take it even one step farther now that I feel, and I'm eating two a day, I poached them and I've been eating two a day ever since I started because it just makes me feel so good. And also it makes me less hungry. It's, it's amazing. But now I'm going to, and I need to find a source out there, internet, if anybody on the internet knows a good way to do this, let me know, uh, to get uh, flax seed, F-L-A-X, flax seed. And flax seed is rich in omega-3. And if you feed your hens omega-3 flax seed, it's the, uh, it, they pr you produce omega-3 eggs, which then are, the ultimate for, you know, even heart health. Wow. Chicken, yeah, let the chicken food get wet and grow the grow your own black soldier fly larva. Yeah, well now, um, I've been feeding them consistently, the, the fly larva, and I'll tell you, they are healthy birds too. I mean, super healthy. All right, so I recently got into, by the way, another thing I really want to add to the yard is a Pakistani mulberry. Um, dying to do that. I've got the now Persian and the Everbearing, but looking to add that. I found one actually at a local nursery. It was like 50 bucks. It's worth 50 bucks in my opinion. I mean, it's like as big as this Persian mulberry. Now, let me share the sunset on this beautiful evening. Holy moly. Yeah. That's all good. So yeah, another Moringa doing well, but this is a more arid location, sunblasted location. So, but here's the, here's the Persian mulberry. Look at the size of these leaves, just right out in the open. This is a wind blaster location. It's also, lo it seems like it loves the sun, but I am surprised at how rigid it is for such a small tree and very pleased with its vertical growth characteristic. I wasn't sure if it was going to do this. A neighbor of mine gave me the cutting. Actually, I planted it in a live stream I did uh, last winter. <laughs> and here it is. And we've eaten a few berries off it this year. Not a lot, but I mean, I've just, wow. So they say it's, it's you know, very superior fruit quality in mulberry world, which I'm sure is a big honor because I love mulberries a lot. And, um, it did not disappoint. The fruit off this thing was amazing. Really good, really different. And it made me also consider, hey, there's a whole universe of, of mulberry possibility just waiting out there like these frangipani. This is a big thing beachside where I live is to grow these plumeria. So you'll see like, if you walk, go down about any street in my neighborhood, you'll find dozens of varieties of these plumeria. I recently added coconuts out front. I don't do a lot of edible stuff out here just because I just never really focused on it. And after all, the channel is called Eat Your Backyard. And if I started eating my front yard, <laughs> now I eat my front yard too. I'm going to eat the side of the yard too. We'll go check out the side of the yard. Look at this woman bamboo. Now, I, you know, like gardening, yeah, edibility, of course. Of course, of course. Novelty, beauty function 
Look at that elegance. I am so stoked on that. That is the one Buddha belly bamboo, like the bulging belly of the Buddha. So shiny, wonderful, wonderful. And if you, if you, if you clump dry canes, now the density of this, I can't really express through this video, but maybe you can hear how solid that is. It's solid and it'll be, I know how solid it is because I've grown this for decades, this, oh, this clump that's been growing for decades. And the, the sections are so tight that they, it's, that compresses it down. And then the middle will be just like maybe that big. So it's almost all strong. This is a very strong cane if you cure it correctly. How do you cure it correctly? Boy, I didn't know this was gonna be a bamboo video, dude. I could just stand here and look at this stuff, you know, honestly. Look at this. This is how you do it. And this is how they do it in some countries, I believe, that bamboo grows in. They cure it in the clump. Cure it on the clump. And then harvest it when it's like this. Look, it still has that shiny veneer on it. So pretty. Now, if you're careful the way you cut it, if you're careful, you can make all kinds of art out of this. Can you imagine the wind chime? Hey, crafty people, just, you know, sink into the possibilities of this cured bamboo, maybe stained, sanded. Look, you could make bamboo eggs. I'm, maybe I should do that. Maybe this is my way of discovering I need to make bamboo eggs. Oh, there's a, there's a perfect bamboo egg. No. <laughs> Look at this, I'll prove to you that we can grow more Robolinis in the shade in a stony apocalyptic situation for Robolini and they'll still grow. Not thriving, but still, you know, functional. We didn't really expect it to thrive right there. Now, this setup, we recently had an underground beehive that was relocated. That was kind of interesting situation. They came in captured the bees and relocated them. Um, but the dragon fruit I've got growing up into that sea grape tree, the sea grape tree serves as the, as the trellis. And recently took the cuttings you saw in the backyard if you were on that part of the st stream. And you can see, this is a way I kind of form my symbiosis, my art of growing things, which is to use the structure of nature uh, in an interwoven wiggly way, as Alan Watts would say. And uh, I certainly think I'm achieving that here. First of all, just the act of tree forming. The sea grape I think is pretty cool. Uh, look at that overarching branch, is that nuts? Native Florida edible. But with the touch of exotic flair, which is the beautiful dragon fruit tree growing up there. And you see, of course, we can't, we can't resist here. The frangipani, the plumeria, that's just a stick jammed in there and look, it's growing. So, all right, now before we get taken away, by the, by the way, this is a highly functional, this is something like back in the day, you know, um, people would have a wood lot where they would uh, go harvest wood for timber and firewood and so on. This is my wood lot, this is, my bamboo clump, uh, it produces all the canes I need for cane pole fishing. <laughs> uh, tomato poles, uh, any anytime I need a little bamboo cane to tie a plant up to in the backyard, a little vegetable or whatever, when we do that, we're ready to go. Now I've been trying to utilize this dingy edge space, which has been almost practically 100% dead most of the time here, years have gone by, but I've decided to vitalize it really and uh, so it's getting now an adequate amount of water but you can see I'm not I'm not sweating the you know the grass green is the color I'm going for and as long as there's not anything with stickers in it or that kind of stuff I'm, I'm okay um, but I've tried to add some things along here and largely unsuccessful these I have planted these um, these moringa trees and they've kind of they got hit by the lawnmower and so but some have survived 
Actually, interesting thing, my neighbor had put this donut around this uh, moringa tree when it was little, which I thought was kind of cool. And then it's grown up around, so I'm just gonna let that moringa tree grow right onto the ring. But uh, this is one of our strongest growers. Very, very stoked on that. And I don't know when we'll exactly trim it, but it'll be at some point pretty soon. It's up to about five feet tall now. That's in less than a year. Um, very, very excited about that thing. We're gonna be using that for forage. And also I'm gonna be making tea quite a bit. Check out this true to style sugarcane patch. <laughs> This is my sugarcane patch and I edged it with mango branches. And uh, the backdrop is a plumeria, which had fallen in a little tropical storm event we had. Uh, again, some roselle doing rather nicely. Some edible pad cactus, which come to find out uh, is a really has a storied history to it, edible, that variety of edible cactus. And then you can see just some small sugarcane things growing out here. But if you look down very closely, what you'll start to see are, are um, things like this. See this? That and that. Those are the telltale firm little sprouts of the sugarcane. And I can see them from here popping up all over the place. So this is going to be a lush, sugarcane patch and i may use the sugarcane to trade and uh etc too so stoked about that but and i may actually expand it at one point i was selling some clippings of sugarcane on the internet maybe i'll do some of that but i've got the urge to start a red sugarcane patch and here it is i did this for the cost of oh i don't know nothing so you could do it too easy yeah, uh, the only thing stopping me from making it twice as big and uh, doing what you know really needs to happen, which is that we have an accompanying green sugarcane patch directly along the side of it. Maybe a nice walkway in between. And you would have a uh, red and green sugarcane cornucopia continuously producing canes in a space that would have been otherwise just, you know, like this which, you know, is okay, but we're not going to use this, really, this place. You know, that that's the bunny cages over there and so on and so forth. And this is kind of an unutilized space, so try to utilize the principle of permaculture, and that's to, to use edge spaces and using it. I'm going to use this edge space to produce a yield, which is another principle. I love putting these things to practice. And... Um, I do a lot of trial and error. <clears throat> so here's a tamarind tree, two tamarind trees planted next to each other. You know, I can get rid of one at any time, but I want to see what, how it grows in this light condition here. They, they fold their leaves up this time of the night, so it's not actually unhealthy. It does quite well. But I want to see how it goes. You know, maybe it'll thrive. Maybe it'll die. You know, and a lot of these things have to uh, stand that test. Sometimes I'll put things in pots in places and see how they do in the pot before I decide to commit like this papaya that had grown from a seed. How much, good question, uh, Deimos. Yeah, how much water do I expect the sugar cane to need? Uh, I expect the sugar cane to need very, very little water. I think it needs water to be able to, to sprout and to like establish itself. And then it's very salt tolerant, or very drought tolerant. And I'll show you one thing here. Since you asked about the sugarcane, that's a cool question. I, when you plant sugarcane from a cutting, so I just cut at each node and just bury it in the ground about an inch deep. And it's one of the easiest possible things in the world to grow. By the way, all of these, all of these uh, leaves just make excellent chop and drop. You can see it right there. They will disintegrate rather quickly. Okay, but here's the thing I wanted to point out for anybody who's thinking of growing sugarcane. First of all, don't think too long. Just do it. Just, if you can get a hold of a sugarcane at a grocery store or anywhere, just plant it and water it. And they don't need fertilizer. They don't need anything. I grow them in beach sand. And I, I do give them bunny turds, but not a lot because I don't think it helps them a lot. I think they're made to grow pretty well without it, to be honest, in my experience. All right, so 
the first sprout will be something like this. You'll get this first, you know, run. Then after you stubble it, after you, the, you let this grow up and then chop, you'll chop it down to just a nub. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that, like this one. Okay, here's, here's one that, if you can see, I, I chopped it there. And now look what happens. Beautiful shoot, another beautiful shoot. Probably get maybe one or two more shoots, but those are big, thick shoots. Now we're in sugarcane. Not this little wispy stuff, but that's the first thing. Yeah, Jack? Yeah, I, I took him out earlier. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. If you want to let Penelope out to run, you can. Oh yeah, look at this. This is the uh, a good example of what I was talking about with that yellow dragon fruit. That's what it does when you can get it growing up a fence. You see now, this is like the, you know, Ivy League schools. You see the vine growing up the, the storied buildings. Well, this is the Florida vine growing up this storied building, which is, by the way, this is a Zen bunny sanctuary and uh, place of, that emanates love and abundance to everybody who who experiences it basically and uh, I can't help but I can't resist in good conscience eating one of these roselles I would just I feel a certain I don't want to damage the plant though I like to trim them off but this will work okay there we have it. Oh, that is a treat. That is a treat. Have you ever had one of these? Yeah, that is a Florida cranberry. Ladies and gentlemen, Florida cranberry. Uh, if you were wondering how can I get my own pectin without going to the store, you would of course want to consider Florida cranberry. And it looks like a dragon fruit, it really does. Okay, and we're gonna, we're gonna go taste it. But inside the little center part has seeds that it won't be ripe in this one. They'll turn black when they're ripe. You'll see the ones in here are white, but we'll feed them to the chickens. But you eat this outer petal part and it tastes exactly like cranberries. If you take these and just cook them up, Break off these petals and cook them up. It tastes exactly like cranberry sauce without adding anything else, but maybe, you know, a little sugar, but I think they're sugary enough as is. If you look at the base of this, you'll see how incredibly fibrous it looks. That's because this is also grown for its fiber. It looks like something straight up out of an alien movie. You might suspect that uh, this could give birth to uh, some horrible thing, but it doesn't. It's just delicious and amazing and so easy to grow. I mean, like levels above levels, easy to grow. Look at that. There's a Persian mulberry I'm cutting. Thanks to Joe Serrano for pointing out this is a Mexican sunflower plant, which, you know, I suppose there's some mixed opinions on. Uh, I think that might be, I don't know. I don't know if uh, that's like a invasive a plant, I wonder but I think it's great for chop and drop. You know, I've got friends who use it that way. Here's that longan tree I dug up from the seed. To show you an example, it's gonna do okay once it comes back. Growing some rootstock mangoes too this year. I mean, why not? But most of all, just basking in the glow of having this lush corner area now just coming into full fruition more of those roselle back there let's go ahead and take a look at this all right so what you do is see that take that off it's like a crunchy leaf i'm gonna eat it Oh man, that's good. Like, really tart. And you can eat every part, this red part. You, I suppose you could eat this middle part too. But that, that middle part is where all that pectin is stored. 
Wow, that is good. You gotta grow these. I grew these all from seeds. Can you imagine how much antioxidants and like vitamins and minerals are in something like that? Absolutely delicious. Well, if you're wondering if I like that, yeah, I liked it. Hey, Jack. What you up to, kiddo? Tending the chickens. Cooping them up. Yeah. If I don't crack this open, I'll have a hard time getting to it tomorrow, but they'll come and find it tomorrow morning. I can just, just crush it on the and give them way in. Otherwise, it's pretty hard. Yeah, okay, good. All right, yeah. <laughs> oh no, what is this crazy bird doing? What are you doing? You're making a nest? Are you going to sleep right there in the dust bath? Dust bath right before dark? Hey Jack, do you think you could, you want to demonstrate how you put a chicken to sleep? Get Sally. Is Sally out? Jack is a chicken whisperer of amazing abilities. Sally is a sweet hen. Who knows a few karate moves, some kicks. All right, let me see if I can get it. She put her to sleep, and I can see her eye. <laughs> I think these chickens are spoiled. <laughs> oh, now you want to go in, Mrs. Mister, Mrs. Dust Bath. There it is. <gasps> She had her eyes closed. You had her asleep. There it is. <laughs> Blinking off, yeah. That chicken is ready for a snooze. Let's take a look in the coop. Loving my system, the system. Hello. Yeah, well, a little bit of end of the night. Looking in there to see if they laid any more eggs. I'm wondering if someday they're gonna lay six eggs for five chickens. Hey, you. She's sold on this duck's bath though. Yeah. These chickens love the dust bath. Yeah, I'm actually going to remove this one thing because they've been pooping on it. That one. I had just two screws there and one on the side and I can get it out. They don't need it or use it. The uh, cross support bar is more than enough. Alright. Good night, girls. Yeah, the neighborhood birds are saying good night too. Yeah. Sure. Are they all? Whoa, are they all up in there? That was a. 
This is the final chicken. Sometimes it's easier just to get them to get in the coop a little bit. They'll get in the coop on their own every single time, but um, you know, if you're out here with them and it's pretty much dark, they were gonna get in in five minutes anyway, why not? It's about time to make some worm tea. I don't think we'll try to do that tonight. In you go. The chicken system. Well, kind of a sleepy night, but it sure is fall. I mean, just look at that sky. It is uh, about as blue as blue gets, honestly. Pretty happy with that. And uh, by the way, the bio, all the biochar talk, here is the biochar spot. And proof is that it's fertile. Is look at all those beautiful chicken vegetables growing in there. Yeah, go ahead, lift that off. And by the way, these chickens, we harvest this. This is practically their favorite weed. I wonder what minerals and stuff are in there that make them so attracted to this stuff. But man, they love it. So yeah, we're gonna produce a lot more biochar in there and then we won't have any branches to deal with. The final puzzle pieces. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, I like to think it is a pretty secure setup for the chickens. Thanks for saying that. Um, I've, I don't have, so do we have predators? We have predators, but not many, I guess. Uh, we have cats, we have raccoons. So, although I haven't seen raccoons in my yard in a while, they are around in the neighborhood, certainly lots of cats. Snakes, uh, never really seen any harmful, any, you know, venomous snakes or anything back here. Always just non-venomous, which I like to see around. I saw him eat a snake the other day, actually a small snake. The chickens ate the snake. But uh, one of the things I did was when I, you know, so there's no way to get into the, into the chicken coop area. It's all 100% fenced in. And then on the bottom, I, I took wire and uh, buried it down and out. So it kind of goes down and out under the ground a couple feet. And it just did that around the whole thing. So even if I did get a, a predator of some type that was a pesky, it probably gets stopped, hit that and turn around is what they say. And then the other thing I did of course was uh, put down these bricks. So I had those in another part of my yard that I wasn't really using. So I just repurposed them here and uh, yeah, so now it's built like, and now that I point out all those things, I go, gee whiz, I built a chicken fort, fortress. I mean, uh, it's pretty secure. And then I, I built the chicken coop itself with very heavy wood. Like those are four by four legs with two by fours around them. And it's like really built sturdy. But, you know, what I've got to be thinking of here is I'm, I'm about five blocks from the ocean. And uh, the hurricane's going to come. Certainly the high winds, and this thing's gonna have to, um, yeah, the raccoons, yeah. So this thing's gonna have to withstand a potentially, you know, high wind events from hurricanes or near misses on tropical storms and hurricanes. So I wanted to have that ready. Uh, I'm a little bit anxious about that idea, but I think it'll be okay. I'm gonna put straps over the top and anchor down to the ground a bit, but it's very heavy chicken coop. And the, and the air can pass under it. So I don't think it's, you know, I think it's uh, maybe got a pretty good chance of doing pretty well in a higher wind event, which I'm hoping it does because uh, chickens can't come inside. But um, yeah, very exciting, you know, to have these chickens. And I'm so stoked that I'm getting the production. I never would have imagined that five chickens could produce five eggs a day. That just um, 
exceeds all my expectations. And it's not every day. It's probably most of the days, though. I mean, five out of seven days it's been. So, yeah, pretty impressed, pretty stoked, pretty grateful for all that. Pretty happy with the whole effect of having the chickens, the bunzos, the whole system, you know, more or less functioning now. You know, just add water, water, and just add a you know, hopeful attitude and uh, work ethic. And, you know, before you know it, it starts to feel like you get all these, like, ideas of, uh, gee whiz, the whole world could feed itself with just a few simple steps. They would be self-reliant. Self-reliant. You could sustain yourself with your own grown food in something as small as this backyard. Now, people have been saying this for a long time. That's certainly not a new idea. Uh, permaculture gurus of all all types will, will say this, and uh, but you got to get the components in place. You know, understand some simple components and uh, kick them off, build them, be the fool before you're the sage. Just be willing to fail. I mean, that's the main thing. Don't hesitate. Hesitation is the enemy. You know, um, how? Why did it take? I look at this and I go, why did it take me this long to implement this stuff that has had such a positive effect on my health? on my outlook on life, on the joy I feel. All that stuff has improved directly because I just decided, hey, I'm going to incorporate some simple systems that I'm drawn to. I'm drawn to this stuff, and I love it. When I eat those eggs, it's like a, it's like a, a deeper experience than just kind of eating eggs because it's something that you know I had a hand in. And that you can produce that even in a backyard in a suburban neighborhood in Florida. Is the groundwater salty, Vicky asks. Uh, do you have rainwater catchment? <laughs> wow, another great question. Uh, yes, the groundwater is very salty. It is a factor in everything that I grow, and I have to mitigate it and constantly factor it in. Everything that I grow out in the yard, while it might look so a little bit tagged, you know, by conditions, and that's likely because of the salt on the sleeves, which I have to go through a process of growing it through this stage to get to the higher stage so that it, um, it can thrive, but yeah, it's very salty. And the question of, do I have a water catchment system? I do. It's just a simple multi-purposed Tupperware container that I put under the heavy, you can see the rain stains on the rocks, under one of the heaviest areas that rains back here. And um, the water just simply fills up in there. So I don't know how much water that is, but it's more than enough to, to water what I consider my hay pasture which um, this bunny run doubles as a hay pasture. We don't mow it. We just, you know, kind of trim, trim it for the crabgrass and hay, like stuff that just naturally plants itself back there. And uh, yeah, so it gives me water in an area that I don't have any hoses near this corner of my yard. So that's what we're doing so far. Now, a better system would be to have, uh, I'm thinking about building a system that's elevated uh, bin system that's, you know, will gravity feed water out so that I can just easily take a hose and water everywhere. That would be far superior and a lot easier, more functional because, you know, now I got to bend over and five gallon bucket my way to freedom. And that's, uh, yeah, kind of, um, interesting. You want to know some, as we stand out here in the, uh, the twilight together, the early days of the eat your backyard channel. One of the videos I made was how to eat Monstera deliciosa fruit, poisonous fruit, <laughs> which it is poisonous. But, um, yeah, so I had a friend that had a, bu had a bush, a big, you know, plant, and I would go pick it there and then eat it. And it's all about letting it ripen. It tastes absolutely delicious. But it, in its early stages, it, the fruit is definitely poisonous. So, you know, you, you want to be careful. I would say anything with acid in it is potentially poisonous, citric acid included, if you had enough of it. But the same idea. You know, you have to let it get to a safe level. And then you don't want to eat too much of it. Well, anyway... Monstera Deliciosa, I've just committed $11, and I'm in the game. I know I mentioned it earlier, but I'm just keep, as every time I walk by it, I gaze upon it and think, that's cool. Now, by the way, uh, one other th thought is that uh, I am in the process of rewriting the Eat Your Backyard uh, intro song and going to be kicking off a very hopefully uh, interesting how-to series on fruit trees. I'm going to be covering a wide variety of different fruit trees that I'm into that that you may be into. Also, how to grow them, 
some examples of them growing in different applications, uh, experiences that I've had with them, maybe uh, some expert testimony on them if I can find somebody who's in the know. And I think I do have some connection now to some folks over at um, some local nurseries that would be willing to certainly chime in. Uh, I had made a video called um, How to Grow Pigeon Peas, which has turned out to be pretty popular. I'm stoked about that. Really, I'm stoked about it because I'm hoping to spread the message of, hey, it's really easy to grow high protein pigeon peas. Go check that video out, by the way, if you're interested. Um, how to grow pigeon peas. But yeah, it's a high protein crop. Chickies love to eat the leaves. Chickie loves to eat the peas. Uh, we love to eat, the, eat it. And uh, it's a pioneer plant for sure in permaculture. But I'm going to be making similar videos about the bananas and about uh, mango trees and figs and mulberries and uh, sour sops and on and on and on and on sea grapes and ginger and sugar cane and all of those happy things because I like growing them here and I hope to inspire you to do the same. Again, thanks for watching Nature Backyard. I hope you will hit the thumbs up button if you like this kind of content. It just lets me know to make more. I enjoyed spending the evening with you. Hope you feel the same and I hope you have an abundant and great afternoon. May the force be with you and may abundance stalk you in your every pursuit. Thanks for watching. Eat your backyard.